I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Our guest this week is University of Texas historian Peniel Joseph. His latest book, The Sword and the Shield, is a dual biography of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. We discuss their contrasting philosophies in the fight for African-American civil rights and their legacies in the context of today's events. Dr. Peniel Joseph, uh, you and I had planned this interview three months back, uh, but we got uh, sidewise with the COVID lockdown. And what a momentous three months they have been. As a historian, how are you processing this time this country's going through? Well, you know, I've been writing a lot, both um, op-eds and uh, for, for a longer piece as well that I've already been planning. But I think that it's an extraordinary watershed historical uh, moment. I do think that we're living through um, a third uh, American reconstruction and effort to reconstruct democracy so that it's multiracial, multicultural. Um, our first efforts were right after the Civil War. We think about 1865 to 1877. And we did achieve some racial progress. Uh, we had 1,500 black elected officials. Um, we had uh, a Freedmen's Bureau. Um, we had the creation of black churches and public schools. Um, but we also institutionalized racial segregation uh, rather quickly uh, by the 1880s and 1890s. And we did it through racial violence and public policy. Um, and then our second reconstruction is really the civil rights movement, when we think about the modern civil rights movement, uh, between 1954 and 1965, when we think about public school desegregation and the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65. And there was, again, racial progress, um, but that was really quickly closed off um, when we think about 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., assassination of Bobby Kennedy, uh, assassinations of Malcolm X. Um, and now we have just this another effort at this. And I think in a way, uh, we're, extre- we're experiencing just something that we've never experienced before because we have so many white Um, Americans who are joining these protests. So it's multiracial, multicultural. It's certainly led by young black people, but so many white uh, Americans have joined that uh, the very face of the country is being changed um, every single day. And what do you make of the fact that the protests are not just happening in the United States, but globally as well? Well, we really have great historical precedent for that. That's not unprecedented. Things that happen in the United States impact the world and things that happen around the world impact the United States. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, the United States, when we think about the civil rights movement, it was also a movement against colonialism. It was a movement that wanted liberation in Africa. It wanted a free South Africa, end of apartheid there. It wanted liberation in India um, and and Asia uh, and Latin America and the Caribbean. And we saw all these different networks of different activists and human rights and civil rights organizations who knew each other And certainly Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were two iconic uh, black civil rights and black power activists who visited the Middle East, who visited Europe, who visited Africa. So that's not surprising. Um, The the depth and breadth of it and the intensity um, is really extraordinary, but we definitely have historical precedent for that. If there And there have been a number of times since the 1960s when there have been movements for social justice and protests in the United States. What do you think uh, are the elements that make this transformational, as you're calling it, this time around? Well, I think a number of things. I think COVID-19, the pandemic, and the fact that uh, African Americans and, and other people of color were disproportionately vulnerable to COVID-19. They died at higher rates. They were diagnosed at higher rates. Um, They were more likely to be public-facing employees uh, in meatpacking and the post office and delivery services, restaurants. Um, I think the mass unemployment that followed that. And really just um, a breakdown of the way in which our government responds to inequity. So I think there's a rising um, wealth gap. Um, Certainly the criminal justice system and the tragic uh, killing of George Floyd becomes a precipitating event. But I think all of these things um, have come together and converged at the same time uh, to produce this really historic uh, 
moment in, in American history that's impacting culture, it's impacting politics, it's impacting sports, business, uh, just you know, higher education, you name it, it's impacting it. And it's deeper than the criminal justice system. It's about more than Confederate flags and monuments. It's really about uh, reimagining American democracy to create what Martin Luther King Jr. called a beloved community that was gonna be not only free of racial and economic injustice, but citizens were gonna have guaranteed rights, um, you know, guaranteed income, decent housing. Uh, there wasn't gonna be pervasive systemic racism and inequality, and people would really have deep empathy towards each other, and the government would reflect that. So I think people are demonstrating in the streets in a way that amplifies all these historic civil rights protests that we've seen before, going way back to racial slavery and abolitionism, we're seeing that come to full force in 2020. So I think we're gonna all look back at 2020 as this extraordinary uh, watershed year. As a historian, this must be a really interesting time to be looking at. What are you doing to sort of gather all of the elements of the moment uh, so that you and your fellow historians can study this time in future years? Yeah, a number of different things. I mean, I'm interested in both what's happening locally here in Austin, Texas, where I live, um, seeing the real um, the interest in people calling for um, defunding the police, prison abolition, um, intersectional justice, and the way in which these contemporary movements are really intimately connected to um, public policy. In a way, when we think about the civil rights movement historically, People were always interested in changing policy when you think about voting rights acts and civil rights act. I don't think we've ever had social movement quite like the Black Lives Matter movement that is interested in policy changes at such a granular level. When you think about everything from criminal justice to uh, juveniles and incarceration to public school segregation and residential segregation, uh, environmental racism, mental health in black uh, communities. Uh, trans and, and LGBTQ lives mattering and being centered. Um, so I think as a historian, you're just trying to gather uh, as much data as you can um, and link that data to the archive, because the archive is how we make our trade. But since this is unfolding, it's going to definitely be newspaper reports, it's social media, um, it's, it's just from many, many different perspectives, you're seeing this story be told. Journalism is going to be the first draft of history but then historians are going to try to connect this to what they call a thicker description to say, how are these institutional changes that people are advocating in 2020 connected to, say, 1968 um, and what we did or did not do as a nation? And really, in a more immediate sense, how is what's happening in 2020 connected to, say, 2008, when a lot of Americans thought that we had finally licked what people euphemistically refer to as the race problem? with the election of Barack Obama. So I think that as a historian, you're trying to gather as much information as possible, but you have a longer view of these events than most journalists or most people. So in the 1960s, and we're going to start digging into the period that you wrote about in your new book, but in the 1960s, there was a great deal of focus on the passage of the civil rights legislation. The list that you just made of the many different threads in society that are seeking change is really long. How does um, that broad list, with so many people having things that they want to have addressed in society, uh, as opposed to a very common focus in the 1960s, translate into real momentum for change? Well, I think the civil rights movement was always a human rights movement, and I think it still is. It's just that it's a movement that wants universal rights, but through the particular lens of black liberation and black history and black people's struggle for dignity and citizenship in the United States. So I think it really, really connects in the way that if you end systemic anti-black racism, you're gonna really free up resources, you're gonna free up access to dignity and citizenship, but really scores of different groups, um, whether those are Latinx or indigenous, Native American, Asian, but also people who have mental illness, people who are LGBTQ, people who are uh, the most marginalized in our society by virtue of who they are. And I think in a way, uh, 
the black freedom struggle has always been the most expansive uh, movement for democracy, not because black people are somehow so special, but because of the historical conditions and the social economic conditions that they've been in uh, historically in the United States. They've always been pushing to expand what we think of when we think about American democracy, the, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. And again, Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most eloquent voices here in his letter from Birmingham jail in 1963, when different white faith leaders are asking him to wait and to stop the protest in Birmingham. He says that the young people in Birmingham who are being arrested and incarcerated and brutalized are gonna one day be lionized by the nation as heroes for bringing us all back to those, what Dr. King calls those great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the founding fathers. So in a way, the whole entire black freedom struggle is an effort to expand um, American democracy so that it's broad enough to include um, black people. And even this idea of Black Lives Matter, I think it's a extraordinarily eloquent phrase, but it's a, it's a phrase that is a testament to the fact that throughout American history, black lives have not met. Um, and in fact, it's been, it's been quite the reverse. And so there's always this push to try to get those lives to matter um, in law and policy, but also in our, our culture. And I think that's what's so important in terms of what's happening now. We need, we need policies, we need politics, new policies, new politics, new institutions, but we have to also change hearts and minds and have a culture that respects black people and in turn that's going to respect all people. Well, let's uh, spend uh, more of our time then on your book in which you tell the antecedents of this period in the 1960s through the eyes of uh, the lives of two leaders, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. The book is on display behind you. Its title is The Sword and the Shield. Let's start by uh, hearing these two men in their own words, and then we'll come back and talk about them. I don't think when a man is being criminally treated that some criminal has the right to tell that man what tactics to use to get the criminal off his back. When a criminal starts misusing me, I am going to use whatever necessary to get that criminal off my back. And the injustice that has been inflicted upon Negroes in this country by Uncle Sam is criminal. Somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Dr. Joseph, you write in your introduction that the idea of a dual biography of these two men had been germinating with you for a long time. Why uh, did you take the, upon yourself the study of these two men and how they both ap approached the goal of civil rights in the United States? Well, my, my whole scholarly trajectory, my career as an academic, but also as just a citizen and an activist, has been based on civil rights, has been based on human rights, uh, the connection between race and democracy, uh, and, and black freedom in the United States and globally. So I've written books on the black power movement. I've written books on uh, Barack Obama. I've written a biography of Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, who was uh, a black power leader. Um, and through, through those books and that research, I became increasingly fascinated with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and really I became, uh, I started to reimagine what their roles in terms of transforming American democracy was just through study and just reading and, and finding out more about them in great biographies, but the archives, looking at their papers, looking at their speeches, listening to their speeches. And I really came to the conclusion that when we think about Malcolm and Martin, we in popular culture think of them as uh, dueling opposites, uh, as polar opposites. One is talking about nonviolence, the other one is talking about self-defense. One is saying by any means necessary. The other one is talking about um, a beloved community. Uh, one is Harlem's hero. The other is America's apostle. And I really came to the conclusion that they're both revolutionaries. Um, they are dual sides of the same revolutionary coin. And when we think about the sword and the shield, we usually think of Malcolm X as the political sword of the black community and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as the shield of the black community. And they both serve those roles simultaneously, I argue, in the book. And by doing a dual biography, you're able to really see 
what each was doing um, at the same simultaneously. So in a, in a way, they serve as each other's alter ego. I think, as you see in The Sword and the Shield, a lot of times they're both thinking about each other, even if they use surrogates to debo- debate each other. And really towards, um, by 1963, 64, a lot of what they're doing is really in tandem. And certainly they're going to meet at the United States Senate in 1964. And, and they're going to cultivate uh, a relationship that's less, of, that's less adversarial. Um, they're, they're less rivals than at times uh, complementing each other uh, in their pursuit of radical black dignity and radical black citizenship. Well, you write in the book that uh, not just were the two perhaps symbiotic in their careers, but at the time that Malcolm X was seen as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's evil twin. What were you, what were you saying about that, about that? Well, Malcolm is, and we, we heard the clip, Malcolm is black America's prosecuting attorney. He is charging white America with a series of crimes against black humanity that date back from racial slavery to the present. So Malcolm X is really one of the innovators of his own 1619 project, where he's talking about 400 years of racial oppression in the 1950s and the 1960s. So he really is contrasted with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., especially in the 1950s and early 1960s, because Dr. King is Black America's defense attorney. He's defending Black humanity to the white mainstream but he's also defending white humanity to civil rights activists, to black activists. Malcolm X is different. He takes black humanity as a given, and he's not going to um, try to defend black humanity to whites. But Malcolm is viewed as as Martin Luther King's evil twin because Malcolm is a Muslim. He's not a Christian. Malcolm is a former um, prisoner. He's he's an ex-con at a time where... That's not something that was glorified in our society. Malcolm is incarcerated for 76 months in three different prisons between 1946 and 1952. So he, he's, he's an unusual uh, civil rights leader, an unusual black liberation leader to get that kind of um, political celebrity and achieve that kind of celebrity. And his denunciations of white supremacy are so bold that he both enthralls white media but he also turns people off um, um, because he is such a vociferous critic against structural racism, against white supremacy, and he's willing to name names. He's a big critic of President Eisenhower, Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, in a way that Martin Luther King Jr. is trying to get a political rapprochement with the establishment, uh, certainly up until Malcolm X's assassination. Well, kind of building on that point, uh, as your book evolves, you tell us that Dr. King also evolved in his thinking and that toward the end of his life, he really rethought the use of violence as a tactic. Uh, is this a new thesis? Well, I, Dr. King never, never moves away from nonviolence. What he really rethinks is using massive nonviolent civil disobedience in a way that's going to be even more coercive than Birmingham and Selma. So King becomes a revolutionary because he's no longer willing to sit quietly um, about the Vietnam War. He connects the Vietnam War to the shortcomings and the, the, the failures of the great society in terms of eradicating poverty, eradicating racial segregation. The urban rebellions that are uh, hundreds of civil disturbances and urban rebellions between 1963 and 1968 that engulfed the United States. King says that these are not only just riots are the language of the unheard and the oppressed. He says that the United States has to get to the root of that oppression. So what we see with King, the revolutionary King, he starts talking about using nonviolence as early as 1965, after the Los Angeles Rebellion of 1965, to paralyze cities, to leverage nonviolent civil disobedience to transform American democracy. Malcolm X had called for the same thing at the March on Washington, which Malcolm criticizes the farce on Washington because he wanted a display of civil disobedience that was going to be muscular enough to end the racial status quo in the United States of America. So when we think about King between 65 and 68, he is the biggest critic of white supremacy after Malcolm X's assassination. 
And that's what's so extraordinary. Um, King is talking about white racism running wild in the halls of Congress. King speaks to audiences by 67 and says that the biggest impediment to racial justice in the United States is white racism, which is unleashing chaos in the cities of the United States. Yet whites are in a kind of perpetual denial, and they say that they'll only commit to racial justice once there, peace, once there is peace in the cities, even though Dr. King points out they are the reasons why there's chaos in the cities. So this is not the Martin Luther King Jr. that we think of annually. So King becomes um, a, a man on fire between 65 and 68. He breaks with the Lyndon Johnson administration. There's no more photo ops. There, there's only truth. And that truth is a radical truth. It's a hard truth. When he speaks at the Riverside Church in New York City, April 4th, 1967, he calls the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Those are hard truths. But King says we can have a bitter but beautiful struggle to achieve our country. And that country is a beloved community where instead of spending tens of billions of dollars on Vietnam and war and American imperialism and empire, we actually transformed urban and rural America in a way that was uh, racially and economically just for all people. And so he becomes this extraordinary figure, and that's the Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary king, that I argue that people still don't know about. People who, even our contemporary activists, they don't know what, how, how deep of a revolutionary figure Martin Luther King Jr. was because we sanitized King. We say that Malcolm was the revolutionary, and he was, but we sanitize King because we want a King that is like a teddy bear that we can all hug, that if he were alive today, he would just give all of America one big hug and ask us, ask us to love each other. But that's not the true Martin Luther King Jr. He's deeply empathetic, but he's also deeply critical of inequality, um, wherever that inequality may be. You referenced this, but one of the most interesting facts I uh, found in your book was that these two men whose fears of influence overlapped, both committed to the same cause, only met in person one time. Was that intentional uh, or was it simply coincidental? Well, I think it's, a, it's both. Um, they met March 26, 1964, and right before they met at the U.S. Senate. And they're both, I think one of the most interesting parts about that meeting is that they're both at the U.S. Senate while the Senate is filibustering the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and they both are supporting the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And they both say that unless this is achieved, um, there might be racial violence, although Malcolm one-ups Dr. King and says that even if the bill is passed, if it's enforced, it's going to lead to um, a, a civil war in the South and a race war in the North. Uh, because white supremacy is so powerful, has such a powerful grip on the country. Dr. King says that if it's not passed, there may be racial violence because black America, its, its patience is at an end. Um, when we think about that meeting, that meeting shows that by 1964, they're both making overtures. Uh, Malcolm X is speaking to the journalist, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Robert Penn Warren in 1964. And he says that him and Dr. King have the same goals. And Robert Penn Warren is taken aback because he's a pretty conventional white liberal. And he thinks of Malcolm X as this scary guy who doesn't like white people um, and, and is, is really not consonant with what Dr. King is trying to do. And he says that, look, Dr. King wants human dignity and I want human dignity. We might have different methods, but we have the same goals. And so when we think about that year, 1964, Malcolm X actually listens to Dr. King do an entire speech in Harlem uh, on December 17th, 1964, after Dr. King has won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he comes to Harlem and he's fed it by the entire city of New York. And he ends that evening in Harlem. There's over 8,000 people uh, at the 369th Armory. And Malcolm X is sitting next to Andy Young, um, who's later United Nations ambassador and mayor of Atlanta. And Malcolm and Andy Young knew each other. And Malcolm is really impressed by King's speech. A few days later in Harlem, he discusses Dr. King's speech. He praises Dr. King. Um, and really, a, a couple of months later, Malcolm tries to visit Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, uh, 
and he ends up not being able to see Dr. King because Dr. King is in prison. He's in jail because of voting rights demonstrations. But Malcolm meets up with Andy Young and Coretta Scott King. He does a speech uh, to civil rights activists and student activists, and he personally tells Coretta Scott King how, how deeply he admires her husband, the work he's doing, and that he's in Selma not to cause problems, but to make sure that people know that if Dr. King's uh, voting rights initiative is not passed, there's going to be there's going to be other alternatives, and he tells the press that as well. So we really do see his evolution as well, where he comes to see, and you see it in the ballot or the bullet speech that we need uh, to transform democratic institutions as part of that revolutionary thrust. We won't have much time to to spend on it, but and I invite people to read more details in your book. But I wanted to do a little bit about the biography of each man to understand what brought them uh, to their leadership skills. Malcolm X was uh, born on May 19, 1925. We're going to watch just a little bit of a 1962 video from called The Lost Tapes, Malcolm X, from the Smithsonian Channel in 2018. And then we'll come back and learn about his early years. Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate, you should ask yourself who taught you to hate being what God gave you. His parents, Earl and Louise Little, uh, were uh, both suffered tragedies in their lives. Uh, so what happened to him in his youth that, that gave him the leadership and the communication skills that we just saw on display there? Yeah, Malcolm has a, a, a traumatic childhood. He experiences racial trauma at an early age. He's born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1925 on May 19th. Um, his father, Earl Little, and his mother, Louise Norton Little, are both political activists. They are followers of Marcus Garvey, and Garvey is the Jamaican Pan-Africanist who founds an organization called the, or- the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which really becomes the largest black a mass movement uh, in American history uh, in the early 1920s. There's going to be between three and five million Garveyites on several continents. It's in the Caribbean, the United States, Africa, uh, Latin America. Um, and when we think about Garveyism, this is this idea of, of black nationalism, um, cultural pride, uh, political solidarity, um, political self-determination, racial solidarity, political self-determination. So Malcolm's parents um, moved to Lansing, uh, Michigan, and Malcolm's father is going to be killed in 1931. The Little family is going to argue that his father was killed by white supremacists, a white supremacist group called the Black Legion. The official police report says that Malcolm's father died in a streetcar accident where a car, um, a streetcar, a street uh, uh, car basically sliced him in two, and the family never believes that. And so when we when we look at, that's one tragedy. Uh, so by the age of six, he, he loses his father, Earl, who he never forgets. Um, and his mother is going to be institutionalized in a psychiatric institution because uh, she doesn't really have a great way to make a living. Um, his, his, uh, his, his siblings are going to be scattered and in foster care. Malcolm is gonna spend um, several years in foster care. And finally, at the age of 15, he's going to move in with his half sister because his father had been previously married and had three children. He's gonna move in with his half sister, Ella Mae Collins in Roxbury, uh, Boston. And from 1940 to 1946, Malcolm becomes what he describes as a hustler. He's in Roxbury, he's in Harlem, um, he works odd jobs, but he also sells marijuana to jazz musicians. Um, he, he lives um, uh, a life of, of perpetual crime. Uh, he's going to be arrested and uh, uh, charged with uh, being part of a, a, a ring, a, a burglary ring um, in Boston. He's going to spend uh, almost seven years in prison. 
And it's really while he's in prison, he really reconnects with the side of himself that had really been traumatized. And that's the side that was looking both for a father figure, which he finds in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad um, and the Nation of Islam, but was also looking to be politically active. Malcolm wanted to be a lawyer, but at his predominantly white school uh, in Mason, Michigan, they told him because he was black, he couldn't be a lawyer. I think it's important to remember that Malcolm X was light skinned with red hair and freckles um, because we heard in that clip he was talking about anti-black racism and the way in which um, white supremacy really uh, contoured the way in which so many black people and black communities thought of themselves because they weren't thought of as beautiful. They weren't thought of as, as intelligent. They weren't thought of as fully three-dimensional um, deeply empathetic human beings. And Malcolm pushes back against that. But Malcolm's mother, Louise Norton Little, was from Grenada and was so um, light that she could pass for white, which is something that Malcolm always talks about and felt that he was treated better by his dark-skinned father because he was the lightest of their children. So it's very interesting the way in which race plays a role in Malcolm's conception of politics but he's, he's a brilliant debater. He's um, a prison activist while he's in prison uh, for Muslim rights. Um, he's he's a, a voracious reader, and he goes to one of those prisons, Norfolk in Massachusetts, is, is an experimental prison that provides college-level education. So in a way, I argue that Malcolm X really, he, he gets a college degree and more while he's in prison. And by the time he leaves prison, he's paroled on August uh, 7th, 1952, he um, really becomes this political activist. He becomes this organizer, but he's also an intellectual. He's constantly reading. He's got the great quote saying, you know, he could spend, you know, all day in a library in his autobiography because he's a voracious polyglot of a reader, speaker, thinker, and writer. So he's not just an organizer and a debater. Um, he's an intellectual, and I think Dr. King is an intellectual too. And this book treats them as both activists but also intellectuals because their political thought continues to resonate all the way um, to the present. So if his platform and his mentorship came through the Nation of Islam and uh, Elijah Muhammad, that relationship ultimately frayed. What was the cause of the dissolution of the relationship? You know, the dissolution is going to be deeply political and deeply personal. Um, And I would start with the political. Uh, Over time, Malcolm is trying to transform the Nation of Islam, which is a sectarian religious nationalist organization. It's a very unique interpretation of of, uh, Muslim philosophy and the the religion of Islam. Um, Parts of it are radical, parts of it are very conservative. And so Malcolm, uh, over time, tries to politicize the Nation of Islam, make them part of the civil rights movement, And for a time, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad allows this to happen because Malcolm joins the group uh, from prison and the group only has five, six hundred hardcore members. And really, in large part due to Malcolm's organizing skills, uh, the group is going to have, you know, 35, 40, 50,000 members by the time he exits. So he really transforms that that group into a group that now is a wealthy group that is making millions of dollars through publishing the Nation of Islam's newspaper, Muhammad Speaks, but also through um, the creation of different uh, small businesses and also through uh, uh, real estate purchases that they do over time. So when we think about that relationship, the more political Malcolm becomes, the less, the more tension there is between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And also Malcolm becomes the face of the Nation of Islam. Part of this is due to his talent and uh, Elijah Muhammad saying, yes, you'll be our national representative starting in 1957. But the press and the attention that Malcolm gets over the next six years, it proves to be too much for Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam because Malcolm becomes uh, the first black, radical, global celebrity who's a black nationalist and a pan-Africanist. He's a He's this very famous global figure who can go to the Middle East, which he does starting in 1959 and then in 64 as well. He goes to, he gets feted in African kingdoms, prestigious universities, Muslim imams, because he's Malcolm X, this champion of black liberation and black pride. Um, After a while, that proves too much 
Um, and, and then personally, Malcolm finds out um, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad um, has some personal uh, failings, um, and there's there's been extramarital affairs. There's been um, there's there's been things that Malcolm finds unseemly, and so all that is going to come out by 1964, and is going to lead to the break. But this idea of chickens coming home to roost, when Malcolm says chickens come home to roost in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, Elijah Muhammad silences him from for 90 days. But that is a roost. That is a roost. That is not why. He is forced out of the nation of Islam. He is forced out of the nation of Islam because there's a power struggle uh, between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And Malcolm X wants that group to do be something different. Elijah Muhammad wants it to be a religious organization that is not involved in politics. And Malcolm X wants it to be a political organization that has deep religious faith. Martin Luther King, uh, who was born Michael Luther King on January 15, 1929, you write <clears throat> that his childhood couldn't have been more of a contrast. His father, who uh, had the nickname Daddy King, uh, Martin Luther King Sr., was the highest paid black minister in Atlanta. He and his son toured Europe and, and the Middle East. Uh, he was a graduate of uh, Morehouse College and HBCU and Crozier Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania. What were the major influences in Martin Luther King's life that had him develop his own personal philosophy on how to achieve change? Yeah, M Martin Luther King Jr. is definitely, he's a son of the black petty bourgeoisie, um, Sweet Auburn Avenue. Uh, his father is coming, his father's peoples were sharecroppers, but his mother's are part of that black bourgeoisie. And Ebenezer Baptist Church is this very, very important church. Um, his father had toured um, Germany and Europe. Um, when we think about Martin Luther King Jr., his father, Daddy King, is a huge, huge influence. But also people like Benjamin Mays, who's president of Morehouse College, um, the theologian uh, Howard Thurman. Uh, they know so many different famous Black people who are part of the social gospel. And when we think about the Black social gospel, this is the idea that um, um, you know, a interpretation of Christianity that connects uh, uh, Christianity to social justice. And so the social gospel is saying that we can right wrongs, we can end poverty, we can end racism in our own time. That's very, very influential for King. Uh, King does experience racism. One of the um, convergences between Malcolm and Martin in their childhood is that they both are upset about Gone with the Wind. The, the very, very... Um, racist film, 1939, that's considered a classic that is really a sepia-toned vision of racial slavery in the antebellum South. And Malcolm says that he wants to crawl under a rug when Butterfly McQueen goes into her act, and, and she is Butterfly McQueen and Hattie McDaniel, who won an Oscar, are, are two African-American actresses. But Butterfly McQueen uh, is prissy in, in Gone with the Wind, who's constantly being... Um, hectored by, by Miss Scarlet, Vivian Leigh's character, and even smacked in the face at one point. And those were the images that they both saw. And King remembers the big premiere in Atlanta and being shocked by, by finding out what that film was about and how it depicted Black people. So they both have that convergence. Uh, King was 10 and Malcolm was uh, 15 when that movie came out, 14 when that movie came out. Um, when we think about Dr. King, you know, he goes to Morehouse College, which is the best college for a young black man in the United States. Uh, I would say both then and now. Um, he goes to Crozier Theological Seminary and is part of an interracial group of seminarians, a class of nine or ten, and is voted valedictorian. And then he goes and gets a Ph.D. from Boston University So in 1956. So he has a very, very unusual pedigree. Um, I would argue that the reason why King... Um, at least initially, has more hope for the ability of American democracy and democratic institutions to reform themselves is because of that history. Malcolm has been not just in prison, but Malcolm racially traumatized starting at the age of six when his father was killed, um, really experiences America in a different way, which is why Malcolm is always saying American democracy is nothing more than American hypocrisy. King never says that, but by 1965, 66, 67, 68, and you saw it in the, uh, the, the clip that you played initially, when King is saying things like, the greatness of America lies in the right to protest for right, 
he is acknowledging this yawning chasm between democratic um, ideals in the United States and the reality of American democracy. So they come to converge in terms of some skepticism about American democracy as well, although Malcolm always has the classic quip about American democracy being nothing more than hypocrisy. I want to fast forward to the year 1963, so full of momentous events. Uh, and uh, John F. Kennedy, the president at the time, you write about Malcolm, uh, excuse me, Martin Luther King's views of John F. Kennedy on civil rights issues, which were less than positive. What did he think of the president's approach to it in the early days? He didn't think that Kennedy did enough. He, think, he didn't think that Kennedy empathized deeply enough with black people as human beings. Uh, certainly, Kennedy's going to undergo his evolution, and I write about that. And by June 11, 63, Kennedy makes this what I think is the finest uh, speech of his presidency. But, but Dr. King is very critical of Jack Kennedy in 1961, 62. Kennedy had sought Dr. King's endorsement. King didn't endorse anybody in the 1960 election. But... Dr. King is in jail for about nine days in Atlanta in 1960, and John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy are instrumental in getting Dr. King released, and they they use uh, that to help them win uh, more Black support, and that really helps tip the election in their favor. So King and Kennedy are really intricately tied politically, but John Kennedy, until um, the spring of 1963, is too cautious. He doesn't really know what to do about civil rights and racial justice. He doesn't want it to take over his agenda. And Martin Luther King Jr. is very, very critical. We do have a short clip from that June 11th, 1963 speech from the JFK Library, where the president speaks to the nation about civil rights issues. Let's listen. The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk it is a time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives. Why was that, as you write, one of the most important dates in America's civil rights history? Yeah, I mean, that's an extra extraordinary speech, and it's definitely reminiscent of what's happening today outside of our windows. Um, June 11th is going to be the day that uh, George Wallace, the segregationist governor of Alabama, makes his infamous stand at the schoolhouse door. Uh, he, had, he had vowed to not let the University of Alabama be integrated, but it is going to be integrated. Um, and we, we, we get um, um, two African-American students there. Uh, Kennedy does his speech at 8 p.m. that night, um, which is an extraordinary speech where he says that civil rights is a moral issue. But he also says that those who do nothing um, about the revolution that's happening, invite shame and violence, and those who act boldly recognize right as well as reality. Um, and it's really the best speech on racial justice uh, that a president had given since Abraham Lincoln. And uh, the next morning, a few hours after Kennedy's speech, around 1 a.m. Um, uh, Jackson, Mississippi time, the NAACP field secretary uh, one of the, the, the most important activists of his generation, Medgar Evers, is going to be killed by a white supremacist. He's going to be shot in the heart um, while right after he's, you know, driven into his driveway and his his wife, Merle Evers, and their kids are going to be right there um, while while he while he dies. And that's going to be one of the big civil rights um, assassinations. Medgar Evers is a martyr who joins Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., um, the Kennedy brothers in this period. So that June 11 speech, though, is really, really important because in that speech, Kennedy is following Dr. King's lead. Dr. King had always made the argument that the Kennedy administration should not think about black citizenship as something that was peripheral to the United States of America and American democracy. Dr. King made the argument that it was it was central. So 
King is making the argument that racial justice should be the beating heart of American democracy. And that day, President Kennedy says the same thing. That's what's so important. But Kennedy says that because of all these demonstrations. Kennedy speaks uh, at the midway point of a 10-week period in the spring of 1963, where 15,000 Americans were arrested for civil rights demonstrations. So when Kennedy says there's a revolution happening, he's not kidding. He's saying, look, there's a revolution happening, but he's, he's showing supreme leadership by saying, this revolution can be violent or peaceful, but because we are the United States of America, we have to remember who we are, what our core values are, and this, this issue of systemic racism and white supremacy, it should have been over 100 years ago. And he says that because 1963 is the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. So Kennedy shows um, extraordinary leadership after being pushed and inspired by Martin Luther King Jr., the movement, and really the activism of Malcolm X is part of the whole ferment of 1963, Birmingham, Alabama, um, all these large gatherings. You know, Dr. King speaks in front of 35,000 people in Los Angeles in May. He speaks uh, before 125,000 people in Detroit in June. And then he speaks um, in front of 250,000 people on August 28, 1963. So what we can see in 63 is there is what Kennedy calls a rising tide of discontent. But I would say 63 starts the generational opportunity that happens in the 1960s. We can argue that it ends by 1968 with Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, but without 1963, there is no Civil Rights Act of 64. There is no Voting Rights Act of 65. It's not just Selma. It's not just Mississippi Freedom Summer. It is 1963 is what sets the nation up for the racial progress that it is going to make in the 1960s. Of course, by November 22nd of that year, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, uh, and it, it, it fell to his successor, Lyndon Johnson, to carry the civil rights le legislation across the finish line. Um, how important was he to the ultimate passage of that legislation? So I'm, I'm thinking about the, the larger question. How important are presidents in times of actually uh, cementing the change that the public are asking for? Well, I think presidents are important, um, especially in that time. That's going to be um, a time where a president arguably had more power in terms of uh, transforming legislation than our own time. This is a, a time period without the same um, uh, pressures for, 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 for camp to campaign and to raise money, uh, without the same concentration of wealth and power that impacts of politics, even though it exists, of course, in 1963, 1964. Lyndon Johnson is very, very important. Um, LBJ uh, starts out as somebody who civil rights activists and King were very wary of. He was um, from Texas. Uh, he had been Senate Majority Leader when they passed a Civil Rights Act in 1957 that didn't really have teeth, that didn't really have enforcement and was a kind of compromise. When we think about um, Lyndon Johnson, people didn't expect Lyndon Johnson to be the kind of New Dealer, great society, anti-war poverty, civil rights president that he became. Um, he really uses and leverages both Kennedy's assassination, but also the, the, the civil rights movement and the social movements that are happening um, on the ground to really make an argument that civil rights legislation is needed um, for the functioning and the health of American democracy. That's his argument, and certainly, in 1964, uh, the, the election of 64 gives him a sweeping majority in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And over the next two years, when we think about civil rights legislation, um, we're going to see, you know, really transformative legislation in terms of the Voting Rights Act. But even during the first year, we see the Civil Rights Act is passed. But what's so extraordinary about LBJ is that LBJ and Martin Luther King Jr. have a, a close professional relationship um, the first couple of years of that presidency that is very, very important in terms of 1964 and 65. But that starts to fray um, pretty quickly after Watts, and they become um, adversaries rather than um, collaborators. We have just eight minutes left. Uh, Malcolm X himself was assassinated February 21st, 1965. You say that the debate uh, over his legacy continues, as do the conspiracy theories over his killer. What do we know about uh, how he met his end? 
Well, he's going to be assassinated on February 21st, 1965 at the Audubon Ballroom in Washington Heights um, in New York City. And when we think about uh, this idea of conspiracy, certainly we know that uh, the FBI and New York Bureau, um, uh, the, the New York, uh, the Bureau of Special Services, uh, Special Secret Police that's part of the NYPD, both had informers uh, in the Nation of Islam. We also know that the Nation of Islam had people who wanted Malcolm killed because Malcolm had not only exited the, the, the group, but he had also spoken um, harshly against Elijah Muhammad. Um, so w- we have a confluence of different people. We have three people who were uh, sentenced to prison, um, and there was there was allegedly five uh, shooters. Um, the first shooter shoots Malcolm with a gunshot in through his heart, and so he's he's basically that's going to be the mortal fatal wound. Um, but there's always been uh, controversy over who actually did it, and and of course there's a there's a series who killed Malcolm X that has uh, inspired a uh, New York State to really reinvestigate um, the, the murder of Malcolm X. So there are still unanswered questions about who exactly killed Malcolm X. I would say that there are many different people who wanted uh, Malcolm X out of the way, and that, that's going to include both people who were connected to the Nation of Islam, but also people who were connected to um, the FBI and connected to the New York Police Department as well. So in a very short period of time, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Medgar Evers was assassinated. Malcolm X was assassinated. How did this change Martin Luther King? I think that those assassinations helped turn King into this this pillar of fire that he becomes uh, in 1965, 66, 67, 68. Um, The Black Power Movement comes about and I, I, you know, I write about and narrate King and Stokely Carmichael. And King is critical of the Black Power Movement, but he is supportive of black power activists, including Carmichael, including uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he starts to really connect racial and economic justice. He, he makes the argument that materialism, racism, and militarism are the triple evils facing humanity. Um, he's very, very critical of white supremacy. He's very, very critical of racial segregation. And I think the best example of where King's politics are is when we think about the Poor People's Campaign. And he, he starts this Poor People's Campaign with Marion Wright Edelman, um, and, and they're inspired by Bobby Kennedy saying, yes, bring poor people to Washington, D.C. Bobby Kennedy goes from being this big critic of Dr. King to really being somebody who's, who's, who's more supportive, even though their personal relationship is never necessarily fully repaired. Um, when we think about that Poor People's Campaign, King makes an argument that he's going to bring people from poor whites, uh, Mexican-Americans, Native Americans, African-Americans to Washington, D.C., and stay in Washington, D.C. until all those people who who are representative of the poor people in America have a universal basic income, a guaranteed income. And I think that's truly extraordinary. And he is assassinated on Thursday, April 4th, uh, 1968, about 6 p.m. Memphis time, on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, which is now a civil rights museum, and he's assassinated helping 1,100 uh, black sanitation workers who are on strike for a living wage. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to talk about his radicalism, his revolutionary politics, he organizes the first Occupy movement in the United States. It's Occupy Washington, D.C. And it's Dr. King who tries to organize a radical rainbow coalition of people of all colors and backgrounds to come to Washington, D.C., and to demand justice uh, in a policy way. But what's so extraordinary, and this is one of the most moving parts of the book, I think, is when Dr. King goes and visits Marks, Mississippi, which is one of the poorest zip codes in the United States in 1968. A segregated, black, um, and the kids have no, no shoes. The parents are telling him that they don't have jobs. They have a little anti-poverty Head Start money. Um, People are in real bad shape. And King has seen this throughout his whole career, but King is in tears and weeping when he sees this. And he says that he's going to change this because this is a crime. He starts to to speak in the language of Malcolm X. Malcolm X had said the way in which Black people were treated was a crime. 
Dr. King says that the poverty in Marks, Mississippi is a crime. And he spends the next several weeks constantly telling anybody. He's at a big rabbinical conference. He talks about Marks, Mississippi. He's in New York City. He talks about Marks, Mississippi. He's at the National Cathedral. He talks about Marks, Mississippi. He says that the black poverty we see in Marks, Mississippi should be the shame of the nation, but that it can be repaired because the United States can achieve greatness uh, when it tries, when it wants to. So he becomes this hugely extraordinary figure. And I think the deeper we look at Martin Luther King Jr. and his politics, how they evolve, the more impressed we, we become because he becomes somebody who's willing to speak truth to power, who's deeply empathetic for poor people. These are the people that the society has deemed worthless and who are not worth um, 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 caring for. Dr. King says, not only are these the people we should embrace, these are the people who should be central to our politics and our conceptions of American democracy and citizenship. So it becomes more impressive the deeper you read about it. I'm going to play it. We have about two minutes left. I'm going to play one last clip, which is from Martin Luther King in 1967, which brings a lot of these themes to bear. Let's listen to him, and then we'll close with your, your final thoughts on their, their lives. Let's listen. In the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. As we close, Dr. Peniel Joseph, what should Americans today think about the legacy of these two men? Well, I think they offer us a chance of looking at our last generational opportunity uh, to transform American democracy, to end institutionalized racism, to defeat white supremacy. And I think they offer us hope because for a few years, the United States was on that path. Uh, that, that opportunity receded and people went and the country went in a different um, direction. I think the importance of Dr. King and Malcolm X is this idea of dignity and citizenship. We can only talk about achieving our country and reimagining American democracy when we achieve black dignity and citizenship. And by doing that, we reverberate um, to human rights for all people. So they give, us, they give us an opportunity to think about human rights, to think about citizenship in an expansive way. But they also show us what happens when a generational opportunity is missed, uh, because really over the last 53 years, we've missed that opportunity. I think we have another one um, in front of us but they give us uh, real, real historic lessons of what happens when opportunities are found and lost and how we can use this current opportunity um, to promote human rights um, through black dignity and citizenship for all people. The book is The Sword and the Shield. Dr. Peniel Joseph teaches at the University of Texas. He's the founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy there. Thank you for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.